Welcome back to the Lowdown on Physics. This is Screencast 4.2 for Interactions of Light and Matter, VCE Physics Unit 4. Today we'll be looking at Young's experiment and its relationship to diffraction. In 1801, Thomas Young showed that light had a wave nature when he set up an experiment much like this. So he had a, a light source, a narrow beam of light, obviously not like an incandescent light bulb. He shone the light through two very narrow slits um, onto a screen in a very dark room. Now Newton, uh, his theory of light was that it behaved like particles and it was you know, very much an accepted uh, standard for what light was. Um, and had that theory been correct, then we would expect that on the other side we would have from the further slit one beam and from the other slit a second beam of light. But what he saw were a series of alternating bands, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, um, much like something like this, where we have our central band and with uh, lessening intensity as we get further and further away from that central band on either side. Okay, if we want to sort of put more of a diagram on it, we call that middle band the central maximum and the intensity sort of continues to fall as we get further away. We notice the distances between each of the bands are much the same distance. Now, since this was a contradiction to the expectation, they had to then come up with an explanation for what they saw. So Young looked at it and basically sort of said, well, as waves pass through a slit, they diffract. We sort of get this circular wave front coming out and spreading out as it tra uh, travels towards the screen. And at every point on the screen, uh, it meets a wave from the other slit. And the result is that we get destructive interference and constructive interference. I've got a diagram on the next slide to help put that into context. So here we've got our two slits, we've got waves coming in and we're going to use Huygens principle to help explain where we're getting these constructive and destructive interferences. So the waves come in, they diffract and where we have our maximums we get these points of constructive interference. So as we look through all these maximums we're going to get constructive interference here creating a bright band. If we follow another one of these lines of constructive interference we get another bright band here and another bright band here and another bright band and another bright band and so on. So as these waves diffract and constructively um, interfere then we get the bright bands. In between that we have destructive interference and that's where we get our dark bands. Now we call these bright bands antinodes. The bits in between the dark regions are called nodes. So you need to make uh, a note of those names in your you know in the memory bank because they'll be asking about nodes and antinodes most likely at some point in your exam. To help explain why we get these bands that are bright and dark, we need to look at how far the light travels from each of the slits. So if we look at the first, or we look at the um, first antinode, so the, we've got the central maximum, we look at the next antinode, then we get a difference of one full path length that's been travelled. Okay, so each of these nodes has constructive interference because it travels one whole path length further. So we can actually calculate the path difference and this is a common exam uh, question. So if we look at to find points of constructive interference, if we want to find the um, second antinode or the third antinode, it's going to be three times the wavelength is what the path difference is going to be. So the difference to get to that third one, it's got to travel three whole path lengths. If we want to go to the nodes where there is destructive interference, then it's half wavelengths. They have to be out of phase by a half wavelength so that they meet completely out of phase and destroy each other. So to calculate that you do n minus a half. So the first 
um, dark spot is going to be a half wavelength different. The second dark spot will be one and a half wavelengths in difference. And just for interest sake, when you shine white light through double slits, we get these bands of coloured light. Why do you think we would get those bands? And the answer is, well, different path lengths for the red, the blue, the green um, to travel. Therefore, we get constructive interference at different lengths. So I want to now just sort of turn our attention to the actual interference pattern. Uh, I've just opened up a little Java applet off the internet and want to have a look at what's going to affect the spacing of the um, antinodes and in what way it will affect it. So if we have a look firstly at the wavelength, so we're starting at a small wavelength at the uh, blue-violet end of the rainbow and we move through to the red end, what we notice is that the distance between these nodes uh, increases. So move that back to violet. Now what happens if we increase the distance between the uh, slit widths? So as we increase the distance between the slits, we find that this distance gets smaller. So increasing wavelength, larger, increasing the distance between the slits, it gets smaller. And then as we would expect, if we increase the length to the screen, then we're going to get much larger distance between our antinodes. So to summarize that, factors that are going to affect it are slit separation, which we'll call D, the distance to the screen, we call L, the wavelength of light that we're using, obviously the speed of the light and the frequency that it's coming to, and that's, that's you know linked into our wavelength. So the extent of the diffraction is going to be proportional to its wavelength, so increase wavelength, increase the amount of diffraction, and inversely proportional to the slit width. That is, where it's inversely, it means the opposite happens. Increase the slit width, you decrease the amount of diffraction. The next equation I'm actually going to show you is strictly, it's not part of the course, but it really is a useful equation to just whack on your cheat sheet um, because it, it summarizes it all neatly. So the distance between our nodes equals lambda L over D. So proportional to lambda, proportional to the length from the screen, inversely proportional to D. Or if we put lambda in terms of F and V, it's VL over FD. Now, they're not going to strictly test that, but if you use that, it's very easy to answer the analysis type questions of what effect would it have changing it from red light to blue light, for example. Okay, so delta x, the distance between the central maximum and the first antinode, or the distance between our antinodes. And, you know, really, in the context of our exams, they're interested in whether delta x is getting larger or smaller as you change these other variables. So they're not going to ask you to calculate it. But let's have a look at that anyway. So before we go any further, let's just note that this is only going to happen when our sources are pretty much coherent, okay? because we need them to be constructively and destructively interfering. So let's have a look at a couple of things here. Replacing the two slits with two separate light globes. Why is that not going to occur? Well, because we're not going to have any diffraction. Two separate light globes to illuminate the slits, well, they're not going to be coherent. Two lasers, one through each of the slits. Whilst the lasers are coherent themselves, they're not necessarily in phase with one another. Now, a useful tool, um, or the useful thing we can get from this experiment, was that we were able to quite accurately measure the wavelengths. Uh, based on the past path difference. You can measure D because you'd set that up. You could measure L and you could easily measure delta X um, by recording that on the board. So then you could work backwards to calculate lambda. 
OK, so let's have a look at a couple of examples. Light's emitted from a laser through a pair of thin slits. We've got a distance of 50 micrometers. So that's 50 times 10 to the negative 6. 2 meters from the board, that's L. There are five bright spots over 12.5 centimeters. So that means that there are four distances to measure. So we can calculate that a lambda based on this information we've got um, 0.025, we've got 0 0.00005 for each of the, um, sorry, for the, the distance, 2 metres from, giving us 625 nanometres. Okay, so I'll just reiterate, this is not something that's technically on the course, but it gives us a bit of an idea of uh, the use of this, um, this, this stuff that we're studying. Okay, now which pattern would produce a wider diffraction pattern? We've got two wavelengths, um, larger wavelength, you expect a larger um, diffraction from, smaller slits, you expect a larger diffraction from. So we've got delta x equals lambda over d, so they're inversely proportional, that should, and that one should there. But we can plug that in and get a, a ratio here. So we've got 76.56 for the first one, and we've got 85.245 for the second one. So that's really it. We'll look at single slit diffraction and then uh, how Maxwell sort of tied all this together in with a Model 4 um, light that we still use today in our next screencast. Thanks.